Okay, well, welcome everyone to this month's webinar. I'm Jeff Perlman, I'm founder and CEO of Zojo, and I'm here with Tim Dietrich, who's going to be talking about how to use Zojo to develop FileMaker apps, uh, or to, to build Android apps that access FileMaker, I guess is the way to best say that. So Tim, take it away. All right, thanks Jeff, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, so yes, this is uh, gonna be a webinar about how you can use Zojo to build Android apps that integrate with FileMaker databases. So first, just a little bit about me, for those of you who don't know who I am. Um, I'm a developer. I specialize in custom software, usually for businesses that are running on the NetSuite ERP system. Uh, but I also do work for uh, companies that are using FileMaker, and there's a surprising amount of overlap between those two. As a matter of fact, I'm seeing more and more of that um, over the past year and a half or so. Um, and I can talk about that later if, if people are interested as like why I think that's happening. I've been using FileMaker for a really long time, since 1993, <laughs> which is scary. Um, and been using Zojo for, I think, almost exactly 10 years. This was around this time back in 2014 that I started using Zojo. And ironically, when I uh, chose to go with Zojo, it was because I was moving away from doing FileMaker development. So that's another story for another day. Um, I'm an independent developer. Don't work for anybody. I actually have my own just sort of solo business here in Richmond. And if you're interested in learning more about me, there's my uh, the URL to my website. Right. So here's the goals for today's webinar. If you've been on one of these webinars that I've done before, it's pretty much the same idea. I'm try to give you a quick overview of Zojo and then show you how you can use Zojo to develop, again, an Android app that integrates with FileMaker. And... Um, really try to encourage you to give Zojo a try. There's some misspelling on that slide. <laughs> um, my goal is really just to get you interested in it, have you give it a shot and see if you can develop your own apps, whether they're Android, iOS or whatever. So the first thing we're gonna do is show you a demo of the app um, that we're kind of gonna build uh, really, we're not going to build it as much as I'm going to show you the app, and then I'm going to show you what the Zojo project looks like and kind of explain what it's doing behind the scenes. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, is do that, give you a demo. So let me uh, put out a keynote and um, go over to Zojo. So this is the Zojo project file. Uh, it's, again, it's an Android project. And if you've never seen Zojo before, it's probably going to be a lot of new stuff for you to try to take in here. Uh, but most Zojo projects basically look like this. So one of the things that's interesting about Zojo is that's the name of the company, the name of the programming language. Uh, I could go on and on. But um, in this particular case, in this project file, uh, you know, again, it's Android, but if you were to open up an iOS project or desktop project or a web project, they all basically kind of look and feel the same way. A lot of the similar concepts across those different project types. And that's one of the things I really like about it, because if you learn how to build apps for, say, Android, then when you go to build one for iOS or a desktop app, they're very similar. I'm not going to say that they are exactly the same, but they're similar in concept. And in a lot of cases, you can take some of the code that you've written for one project type and reuse it in another. Um, right now with Android, we have both an Android project type in Zojo and an iOS project type. And Jeff, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about the, the ultimate goal being to kind of combine those two project types into a sort of mobile app project type, right? That's Yes, the, the the that's the long term plan. When you build desktop apps today, you build a single project and you pick what you know desktop targets you want to build for Mac, Windows, and Linux. And we are making we're taking steps towards bringing iOS and Android together into a single mobile project type. Um, and, you know, we continue to you know we know what our list of things is we need to do, and as we check those off, we get closer and closer to having a single 
mobile project type, which is the ultimate goal. Yeah. But for now, we have, again, iOS and Android on the mobile side. And as Jeff said, you know, we've got desktop app projects where you build a single, um, with a single project, you sort of lay it all out. And then you say, okay, I want to compile it and distribute it for Mac OS, Windows, Linux. Um, and what I really like about the desktop Linux support is that you can also, of course, compile those and then run them on a Raspberry Pi. And that's become one of my little side passions. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of fun. It's so also again, easy. It's also easy to forget that uh, Zojo builds console apps. So yeah. if you need a, an app that has no user interface and is going to run maybe on a server somewhere, you know, it's easy to build those too. Yeah, those are actually my favorite type of apps to build. And we'll talk about that at some point too. There's they're they're just a lot of fun because you don't have to worry about how the app looks. If you're someone like me who's design challenged, a console app might be exactly what you want to build. Just really depends. Okay, so back to the project. The uh, this is the Zojo IDE where you do your Zojo development. And down the left hand side, you can see all the different um, you know, components that make up this particular project. So there is always an app um, sort of object or instance that's kind of up at the top most of the time. And you can tell, let me get this out of the way. You can click on it and see what kind of a project it is. This is a mobile app. Um, you can set a couple of other things here, like what screen you want to uh, have show up first when the app runs. You can change the theme. This is somewhat unique to, I think it's unique to uh, Android. I'm not sure if there's an equivalent on iOS, uh, but that's kind of nice. And we can play with that later if I remember. Um, so there's an app uh, instance there, and I'll go further into that in a minute. I don't have any icons set up for this project, but if you did have an icon that you wanted to, you know, assign to your app so that it looks nice uh, when you distribute it, you can just drop those in here. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, here's one of the screens that makes up the app that I'm going to show you. This is the login screen, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, there's a list of inventory products, which I'll show you that in just a moment too. And then two more screens. One is designed to kind of show you the details of a product. And then there's another sort of final screen for showing a photo, which I'll also talk about in a moment. So I'm going to run the app and then come back over here and go into uh, more detail on what all these things are and what they do. And bear with me for a minute because um, uh, Jeff, I think you can relate to this. The goofy uh, Zoom control thing always sits right where I want to click. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. The, you mean the the, uh, the the Zoom part? Yeah, yeah the screen sharing. Yeah, I'm always there. having to move it around when I do <laughs> webinars. Yeah, I don't know if I can move that particular one. All right, so I'm running the application, and we'll talk about that in a minute, too. And you're going to see um, this is the Google uh, emulator, and this is actually a part of Android Studio, and I'll talk a little about that too. Uh, so this is essentially a sort of virtual Android device uh, that's firing up here. And I'm going to see the app load in a minute. So what's running right now is essentially a bridge between Zojo and the emulator. It's kind of compiling the app, and then it kind of ships it over to this virtual device and runs it. So here is that uh, login screen that I showed you just a minute ago. And you can see it's asking me for a username and a password. And these this is the credentials that I'm going to use to log into the FileMaker database in this case. So I have a regular FileMaker account set up over in, in FileMaker in the database that's just read only, and it can only um, use the data API. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I'll show you why. If I do, uh, if I start typing the password, it's a password field, but for a second there, you see the letter show up, right? <laughs> so I'm not, that's not my real password. So don't try to log into my server with password secret and username Zojo, but I'm going to stop sharing so that you don't see what the real password is so that I don't log in later and see 9 million records in my database. So anyway, let me stop sharing for just a moment. And give me one second. Try to 
find the right screen. Tim, when I was a consultant uh, forever ago, I was doing some consulting at, uh, I was actually teaching a, a programming class at Boeing in Seattle. And we were all standing outside the room uh, because the door was locked. So no one could get in. And one of the students said, oh yeah, there's a guy from security that's gonna come and open the door for us. So we were waiting and one of the students said, you know, often when they install these locks, they don't reset the password. They just leave the default password. And he walked up to the door, punched in the default password and the door opened right up. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, my password is not secret. I'm not that bad. Um, all right. Let's see. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Okay. All right. I think you guys can see that. All right. So I logged in and this is the first screen that's displayed. And so basically uh, what this is doing, and normally, by the way, it doesn't have that filled in. I'll explain what that is in a second. But this is a screen that you would use to enter your keywords. You can search by name. You can search by part number. And I'll show you the FileMaker database in just a minute. Um, but let me go ahead and just search on this particular. This is actually a part number. And you can see it found one result. I can click on the list view to show you the details. And for this particular product, there is a photo associated with it. And you can click the button here to kind of see what that photo looks like. And it's actually clickable and draggable. And I'll go into some details as to why I did it that way. Um, that was interesting. So there's one of the products. If I search for something like uh, shoes, for example, or just shoe, a whole bunch of products come up, 377. Um, this is some kind of goofy data that I got uh, through one of those data sharing sites. So there's, a lot of these products look the same. Um, you know, it looks like two of the same black uh, version of that shoe. One's actually for men, one's for women, I think, something like that. There's some differentiation between them, but it's just fake data, essentially. Um, and it's actually Adidas products, if you're familiar with that brand. So again, I can click on any one of these and you can see all the details. You can see just how fast it is. If I type in like a shirt, I found three products. So there's that. And before I dive back into the Zojo project, let me just take a minute to show you what that FileMaker database looks like. And here it is. This is actually a FileMaker database that's uh, built on the inventory starter database that ships with FileMaker. Very few customizations at all. Um, this is you know, essentially that starter solution out of the box with really only one modification to it. So if I drill in on one of the form views, the product details layout on this product, you can see those are those shorts that I had pulled up. Um, and this is, so this is really what the database looks like. Again, not a lot of data in there, and it's kind of sparse. There's only 845 records, but I think you can see going back over to the, you know, the the app itself, just how fast it can be. So I can search for things like, I don't know, just the color red, for example, and it brings up 25 products. So extremely fast, and even though there's not a lot of records in the FileMaker database, I think you'd find if we had you know, thousands, it would still be extremely fast. All right. So let me jump back for a moment to uh, the keynote, bring that back up. So I showed you what we're going to build, or I'm going to show you the details of what that pro project really does. Here's why I think you, you know, you should be interested in what we're showing here. It's a huge opportunity, I think. It's an opportunity to develop apps for businesses that are using FileMaker and that want to be able to give their employees, whether they're salespeople running around the countryside or people that are running on the Android devices in, say, a warehouse, uh, give them remote access to a FileMaker database without using something like a web app or something like that. It's a real Android native app. So I said, it's a huge opportunity. I think if you're a FileMaker developer, it's really easy to think, 
you know, well, with FileMaker Go, we can do iOS and that's good enough, but not really. I mean, you've, if you've been in, in the FileMaker business for a while, I'm sure you've run into situations where people ask you if there's an Android version of FileMaker Go and there isn't. I think there's one that they're working on, but I don't know. Um, so there's three over 3 billion Android users out there. Uh, so it's massive. And the Android market share is huge. So it's just, I think for FileMaker developers, it's an untapped market or a market that we just can't really fulfill the needs of yet. So with Zojo, I think there's it's a great way to address those needs and finally start being able to give those Android users access to some of the nice you know, data that we've got in FileMaker. All right, so a little bit about what I'm running here today and a little bit more about Zojo. It's a low-code cross-platform application development tool. As we've said before, you can use it to develop desktop apps for really all the major operating systems, mobile apps now for iOS and Android, web apps, and as Jeff mentioned, the console apps, which are really kind of cool. I never thought I'd ever have a need to build console apps, and now that's kind of my go-to application type. And like I mentioned before, you can also build, obviously, for Raspberry Pi, it's just essentially Linux. But again, that's another huge, I think, untapped market. Um, the as you're going to see, I think, and you'll agree, I hope when you're done watching the webinar, the development model, like how we build Zojo apps or apps with Zojo, I think is pretty logical. It starts to, you know, just sort of make sense to you. It's like, oh yeah, that's how we should be building apps, at least in my opinion. Uh, they have a very generous uh, licensing plan, almost too generous. I've told Jeff before you need to raise your prices, but I think that's a controversial topic in the Zojo community. It's just a lot of value that you get. And you can basically try these, try out Zojo, build an app, run it as long as you want until you get to a point where you need to compile it and deploy it. And that's when you need a license. And Jeff, I don't know if you want to talk about that now or later on, like you know, how that works a little bit, but. Well, yeah, basically you can use Zojo for free. Uh, you only need to buy a license when you need to build an app that you're going to deploy, that you're going to you know, give to other people or install on a server or whatever. That's the point at which you need to purchase a license. That, that's what you're purchasing. And then that license acts, it's a hybrid subscription model. I tell people it acts like a magazine subscription where you get a year's worth of updates and then the... Uh, the following year, if you want to continue to get updates, you renew your license, but any versions you've already received will continue to work, you know, forever. So that's how the, the license scheme works. Right. And when you're running these applications, as Zojo app without a license, um, you do it using the IDE, like you, you've seen me just already kind of kick it off on the Android uh, project. It runs in basically a debugger, and in this case, a debugger, and then the um, emulator. Um, that's the only catch with you know it being the free part. Is it, you know if you aren't running a compiled version, you have to run it in debug mode. The Zojo IDE is free. You know, there's is really, in my opinion, there's no risk. The only thing you're really investing in trying Zojo is your time, which I think is pretty amazing. The other thing that I think appeals to it appeals to me and I think a lot of other people is that Zojo is an established and reliable company. This isn't a startup. You've probably never heard of it before, which drives me nuts. And Jeff, I'm sure it drives you even more nuts. Oh yeah. Um, how long did, has it, have you guys been around now? I can't even keep track of we, it. We were founded. Well, we we shipped the first version of Zojo in 1998. Yeah. So we were founded in 1996, but. Zojo started in 1998, and so yeah, we've been around longer than just about any other development tool, actually. That's, yeah. that's still like on the market, commercial development tools. Yeah, to me, that's the crime. You've been around all that time, and when I say, "Hey, have you have you ever heard of Zojo?" Most developers, sadly, are you know, no, never heard of that. Is that something new? Well, it's new to you, <laughs> but you know, it's been around for a while. So, all right, so that's my little spiel about Zojo. Uh, I have a lot of love for for the technology, for the company. It's just awesome. Try it. It's 
my goal was to get convince you to try it today. So a little bit about the demo. Um, again, the file maker database is just the basic inventory starter database. There's really only one modification I made to it, and I'll explain that in a minute. The Android app, as you saw, is very simple. It's read-only. I'm not showing you how to do things like update, um, uh, update, add, delete records, anything like that. Real simple uh, flow. You log in. There's a list view. As you saw, you can search. You can click to get details. You can see photos. It's very basic. That doesn't mean that you can't build more sophisticated apps with Sojo. Just I just don't have the time in this webinar to walk through all that. And maybe we'll follow up in the future with, you know, examples of more sophisticated apps. So the setup I'm running here today, I'm running the latest version of Sojo. I've got a basically a three-year-old uh, MacBook Pro, which is, you know, starting to show its age. You can see when I'm doing the compiling, it's a little bit sluggish. Uh, would love to get a new Mac maybe later. And then I'm running Android Studio. It's the latest version of that. And the reason, again, that I need the Android Studio is really I need the emulator. And um, Jeff, I think that's the only external dependency, right, when a, for a Zojo app that you're trying to run and test. Yeah, as locally. long as you install Android Studio, then that will automatically come with the appropriate emulator. And um, yeah, that's that's really all you need. Yeah. It's not like I need the studio to do any development work other than it's it's almost like if you've done any iOS development, you know, you need Xcode to get the um, the iPhone and iPad, you know. Yeah, um, yeah the, the reason, money. right. The reason to have, if you're on a Mac and you're doing iOS, the reason to, ha to have uh, Xcode installed is purely so that Zojo has access to the emulators. And, and of course, with Android, you can do the development on Windows as well. Yeah. Okay, so that's my setup. And then as far as the server goes where the database is, I'm running the latest version of FileMaker Server. I think it may have had a patch, but it's still Server 2024. I'm actually running this. Um, I think this is interesting. I'm running it on an Amazon light sale server. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. It's a pretty low-cost server. It's running Ubuntu, uh, the latest version of that, 16 gig of RAM. You can see all the specs there. It costs about $84 a month to run it. A little expensive for my taste, but there you go. I mean, that's that's what this is running on, and it's I've been very impressed by the performance of it. Tim, there's a that means there's a Linux version of FileMaker Server. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. There is no. every day. There was one a long time ago. I forget what happened to that. I you know, Claris pulled support for it, and then they brought it back a couple of years ago, and it's. I was extremely impressed by it. I was actually able to get a, it was my first Linux server up and running um, on this in less than an hour, including uh, dealing with the SSL certificate. And it, I mean, it was the real deal. So very cool. All right. So let's kind of dig back into, um, I'm going to go back over to Zojo and look at the app and just sort of walk through it a little bit more. It's a little bit running in the background. Let me actually stop it. Um, so I mentioned, you know, some of these objects that are down the left-hand side of the uh, IDE. So there's an app, um, an app instance that you're going to find in every project. And in some of the, some of them, I'm going to have things like, you know, an, an event handler. So when the app opens, this code loads. It initializes some of the settings. It's calling these methods here. And I'm going to go very fast here. So if I go too fast and you have a question, um, I guess we'll hold those to the end. But um, so the app opens and it first runs this method uh, called initialize settings. This is where I'm specifying the um, name of my server. Uh, in this case, it's running at fms1.sweetgrid.com the name of the database, and I'm not having it validate the SSL. And the reason I'm not doing that is because I think there's something wacky with the Android emulator. It just, I don't know, it doesn't seem to like um, the SSL certificates or it's not quite seeing it correctly. It's actually a, a Let's Encrypt certificate that's on that server. So if you tell it just don't validate the SSL, it's fine, um, but it will give you a weird error if you try to validate the SSL. So I'm, I'm still running this all over, um, you know, over secure uh, connections and everything, but just telling it, 
don't bother trying to figure out if the certificate's good or not. This defaults uh, method here is actually something that I had fun building out. When you log in, if you're successful, it will save the username to a file locally on the device in a special folder called the application support folder. I'm not going to go into all, all the code here. It's not really very much, but basically it's a way for me to save the username between the sessions. So if you open up the app, log in, and then you, for whatever reason, quit the app and then come back in the next time, it'll look to see if we have one of these little defaults files. And if so, it'll load it and pull out the username. So you don't have to keep typing that over and over and over again. Kind of local storage, essentially. I also have some properties for the entire app. And those are all the FileMaker properties that, again, get set through um, the initialized settings and other, other methods. But basically, it's all the information about FileMaker as properties on the app itself. And then we've got the login form. And this is just a, a screen. Um, if you are familiar with FileMaker, it's, you think of it as a layout. Um, I can drag, by the way, and just go over here. And this is a library of objects. I can just sort of drag stuff out if I want. Um, delete that. But that's what all these controls are, right? So I've got a, I'll talk about that one in a minute, but there's the login button. Here's the password field. The progress wheel, which you'll you probably didn't see it because I logged in and it spun, but I'll show you one of those on another screen. Here's the username field, and what you can do is just right click on these and um, and then add uh, event handlers, basically. So like when the uh, the login form starts to open. This code runs when it's about to show that username field, and it grabs the username that I loaded up in the app, uh, the app control when it when the app booted. This is where it was getting the username from the file. So I'm basically setting it as a default and doing it programmatically. So what happens is this screen loads. User enters their username. Uh, types in the password and clicks the login button. And when they click the login button, the pressed event fires and this code runs. This is kind of what Zojo code looks like. So basically what I'm doing here when the button gets clicked is I check to see if the user entered anything in the username field. If they didn't, I pop up a message and say, hey, please enter your username. And then we just sort of quit. If they do that and then they happen to fill out the form but not hit the password or type in a password, then we do the same thing for the password. Um, and then once they do all that, I make the keyboard go away. I make that progress wheel visible. And then I send a login request. And that's code that runs down here. And I realize, again, I'm going very fast, but hopefully this will all make sense to you if not today, someday. <laughs> and these, um, and, and send login request and process login response, those are methods you created. Right, yep, these are, this is code I wrote. These are methods that run, again, when you, this one runs when you click the press button. And what this does is it uses this control up here called FN connection, which is actually, in Zojo terms, it's actually um, a URL connection uh, control, if you want to think of it that way. And it's a way to kind of send an HTTP request out, whether it's to a website, a web server, I mean, a web service, uh, what have you. And that's what this code down here is doing. It's basically saying, I want to send a post request. It figures out the URL um, and it uses that uh, property that I showed earlier. One of the properties that's up on the app that has the server name to figure out the full URL. And in this case, I'm sending it, like this is going to the data API and requesting a session. So if you're familiar with the FileMaker data API, this is the part, of the very first step that you take where you give it your FileMaker credentials and it comes back, if the credentials are correct, it comes back and gives you a token. And then what you do with the token is use it for all the following requests. 
So I'm doing that. I'm setting the URL. I set a couple of other attributes uh, for the making the call, telling it, you know, it's application slash JSON is the content type. It uses basic authentication. That's what the FileMaker Data API does uh, to give you or to validate uh, your credentials and give you the token, hopefully. And again, I'm using, I'm telling it, don't bother validating the SSL. And then I send the request. And this is actually a method on the URL connection class. Again, that FM connection control that's up there. I'm telling it, I want to do a post and I want to send it to this URL. And then that's this URL connection does its thing. Hopefully it comes back with content, but if something were to go wrong, if it can't even really send the request, it'll stop showing that little uh, progress wheel and bring up an error message and then just sort of stop. There's really not much we could do at that point. However, hopefully you get a response back from FileMaker, in which case I do stop showing the little wheel. And then I look to see what kind of a response it was. Um, if, the, if the data API comes back with 401, status, that's an indication that the credentials you gave were incorrect. And so I handle that specially and just say, hey, your login failed, please try again. If there's if it's anything else other than a 200 response, then it's a, an error that I'm not expecting to get. And so I just have a message that comes up and tells you what the status code was. Um, and if it's a 200 status, that means everything's cool. Everything's good, we've got data back. And so then what I do is I call another method called process the response, process login response. There's a lot of code here for me to go over, but I'll just do it kind of quickly. And there's comments in the code, which by the way, I'll make available um, uh, next week. Uh, but just at a real high level, what it does is it unpacks that API response and tries to decode the, the JSON and do all that good stuff. If something fails, an error message is displayed. You will get in the response, you'll get a um, a code as part of one of the messages that comes back. And if it's anything other than a zero, it means that something went wrong. So a lot of places, you know, when you're making calls to the data API where something can kind of go off the rails. And so this is sort of saying, hey, if something did go wrong that we weren't expecting, let's show a message for that. But hopefully with this request, we get a token back. So what I do is I grab that and shove it up in a variable, a property of the app itself so that I can use it later on. And then this code here is the code I was talking about before, where if, again, if everything went right, I'm gonna take the username that the person used and store it in that uh, folder, the special, uh, the application support folder in a file called defaults, again, so that the next time the user logs in, we don't ask them for the username again. And what's the token for exactly, Tim? So the first request gives you the token, and then every request after that, you have to use that token. It's a session token, essentially, and I think it lasts for about an hour. So a lot of uh, APIs these days use that approach, and FileMaker does too. I'm and that's not, basically for security. Uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> uh, because it seems to me you've already at some point you've already sent your credentials across the wire, right? You're just gonna you're gonna do it less and less, I guess. I guess the exposure of your real credentials is a little less, but I, I don't know. I'm not a fan of it. It's just another thing you have to deal with. And I'll talk about that later too, just about how I don't what I don't have in this project is support for what happens if the token expires can we automatically you know renew it like anyway <laughs> so if all goes well at this point we have a token and then i'm just going to show that inventory list so that's the screen here so i covered a lot of ground in that and a lot of geeky stuff but it's all necessary but at this point again we're ready to start making requests to the data api doing finds getting records back and stuff like that and at this point tim all the code you've gone through is pretty generic and that you'd use the same code and stuff for well any android app that was going to access filemaker that you would ever write yeah exactly as a matter of fact 
you know, you could go up to the app um, under the initialized settings and just change the database. And of course, your server, you know, if you get a different server, but just change the server address, the database, and yeah, the login should just be pretty generic. Um, yeah, that's a great point. It's so again, like that's one of the things I love about Zojo is that you know you could clone this project file, make some changes here, and then you know there's the details that we're gonna like go through in a minute. But yeah, for the most part, that that's gonna be the same model all the time. Yeah, you could even maybe make a FileMaker module or class and expose some of those properties in the inspector over on the right-hand side mm -hmm. so that the user could fill them in without even altering the code itself. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So again, at this point, let's assume we're logged in. The inventory list screen is going to pop up. Like This is what it looks like. The controls that are on this screen, there's not many really. Um, I'm going to talk about the connection class uh, in a second again. There's the button to click when the user uh, is ready to do a search. There's the table where the search results are displayed. Here's the lookup field. Here's that little progress wheel. And let me just talk about some of these controls. So when the screen loads, um, notice that uh, on the lookup field, there's an opening event handler. <laughs> And there's some code in here. Um, the reason that I have this in here, this is code that only runs when we are kind of running in the debugger. This is a compiler directive. I think that's the right uh, term for it. And basically it just says, hey, if, if we're running in debug mode in this particular case, set the value of the field to this goofy um, string. That's one of the part numbers that you saw when I first ran the app. And I did this because I just got tired of typing the part number in over and over and over again. So this is a nice little tip. If you don't want to have to type the same thing a million times, you can do things like this. I did have one of these actually on the password field up on the login screen, but I didn't want to reveal the password, so I took it off. Okay, so there's that. The item table has also has an event on it, which we'll talk about in a moment, but it's basically when the person clicks one of the rows, I'm going to show the details. That's all there is to it. And I'll kind of explain like how it's possible to do it that way. The go button, when you click it, it does a few things. First of all, it makes sure you typed, you put something into the field itself, uh, into the, the lookup field. And then what I'm doing is actually hiding the table and removing all the rows. And I'm doing that because I'm hoping that we get some data back and I don't have to do worry about, you know, like I can, I know the table's sort of empty. Um, so I can load it up with the results of the search. And then I, you know, you'll see in a moment where I display the table again, but it's hidden while the search is going on. And one of the reasons I do that is it's easier to see the progress wheel because it's just kind of spinning on an empty screen at that point. Jumping around here a little bit too, but I also dismiss the keyboard again so that it's not open while all this is happening. And then I send a request to FileMaker to do the find. So that is also another little method that's down here. And I don't have a lot of comments on this one, but basically if you're familiar with FileMaker or with, and or with the data API, I think this will all kind of make sense to you. Basically what we're doing is we're preparing to send the request to the data API and I'm gonna tell it things like, I want you to do the find against the layout name called product details. That is this layout right here. In, in the database. And I'm going to prepare the query, the, the find request, if you will. Um, and there's two, there's two requests actually that are going to go into this find. The first one is I want I want FileMaker to search against the name field for the value that was entered uh, in that field on the control or that control on the Android screen. And I'm also telling it to also search on the part number field. So it's two different uh, requests. They get added to the query. Um, I'm telling it that I want the results to be sorted in ascending order by name. And I want up to a thousand results. 
And I, you know, basically I'm building the request up here. So at some point, when we get down to about this part, I'm ready to say, okay, we're going to send a post request. I build up the URL. And again, if you're familiar with the data API, I think all this will be, uh, will look, you know, if I can familiar to you. If not, the nice thing about this is that you don't really have to know a whole lot about what it's doing other than in your particular case with your database, you might have to change what fields you want to search on, what you want to sort on. But from pretty much here down, it's very generic. So it builds up the URL, um, sets a whole bunch of different values for making the request, and then it sends the request. And that's where this FM connection kicks in again, very similar to what you saw with the login. It sends the request off, and then when content comes back in, um, if the response is anything other than um, a 200 response and we show an error message, hopefully that won't happen. But there's a message that pops up if something goes wrong. And then we process the request, and that brings it down to this method here. And again, very similar uh, in terms of like what you saw with the login screen. I basically unpack the response that we got from the data API. I check for some of the specific error codes. For example, a 401 code means that we ran your, your find basically, but nothing matched. So I handle that a little bit uh, specially, you know, because we know exactly what to tell the users. If it's anything other than a zero, um, we show the weird message that we got back from the data API. Again, hopefully that never happens. Then I start to actually unpack the data itself that the data API returned. It's so like, for example, I can figure out, you know, from the response, how many, um, how many records were returned. We should never have this happen here, by the way, because it should have been caught upstream, but there should always be some data at this point that we got some records back. And then what I start to do is use the response to update the controls that are on the layout. So for example, in the header of the table, which is right here, this big blue box, I moved it around. Um, that's where it'll actually put a message telling you how many records were returned. So that's right here. And then I loop over the records. And I won't go into all the details here, but I start to unpack the records, clean them up a little bit. Like for example, if uh, you know if the units on hand is completely empty, I change it to zero. Um, if there's no unit price, I make it not applicable. That kind of thing. And then I actually use uh, some of the values that came back from the data API to set values on the table itself. So for each record that came back, we're gonna add a row to the item table. And there's actually, you know, you can't see it in the preview, but there's actually two values for each row. One of them is kind of the, you know, the name, the sort of prominent value um, that you'll see. And then the second one is actually the details. And when I, I'll run the app in a minute and you'll see that below the name, you'll see the part number, the price, the quantity available. And then we add that row to the table. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute. That's where um, I'm basically taking the data from the response uh, and putting it in a nice safe place for use later on. This is a technique I've used uh, several times in the past and it's just very successful. Um, so let me, I'm gonna run the app again so that we can kind of talk about what you're seeing here, because the rest of it is actually very simple, I think. I'm going to run the app. There's the, the bridge coming up again. That's this Zojo kind of shipping. This is my understanding of it, Jeff. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's compiling the app, shipping it over to the emulator, kind of installing it on the yeah. virtual device, and then it's it yeah, it's Run basically it. installing it, and uh, while that's a separate app, it's eventually we'll just integrate that straight into the IDE. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment so I can get my password in here. Watching you do this, Tim, has made me realize that there's a feature that Zoom should have. Um, they should basically be able to figure out if there's password information on screen and and redact it automatically. 
Yeah, that would be really good. Some yeah. like, AI. I'm gonna make that I'm gonna make that feature request today. Well, I have a feature request for you too, which is when I'm typing the password in a password field, have it not, and maybe it's not something you can control, but uh, don't preview the text. Like, don't show me the key I just typed. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that that's just the native functionality of the password function on Android. That's what I was afraid you'd say. Yeah. Okay, let me go back to sharing my screen. All right, so we've got the, uh, I logged in. I hope you guys believe I'm actually logging in because I have no way to prove it other than actually sharing my password. Um, but here it is. Uh, and again, like kind of going back and forth a little bit between, you know, the uh, screen here and the IDE and what you're seeing here. Um, you know, they. I hope you can see that they look pretty much the same way. I'm going to click go. And again, you can see how fast it was. This is where I was saying that the table header gets set with information about the total number of records that came back. And then here's, you know, it's adding a row to the table. There's the name of that product. And then below it, I don't know if you can see it or not. I don't have a way to zoom in, I don't think. But there's the part number, the price, and the quantity available, um, you know, all shown right there. And by the way, you know, you I've shown a couple of searches here, like, uh, you know, shoes and stuff like that. If you're a FileMaker person, you're probably thinking, like, can I use wildcards? So, and you can. So I just put um, an asterisk in there. I'm seeing all 845 products uh, from the database, which is really kind of cool. That is the FileMaker Data API doing its magic. Um, you know, so there's all the products here. All right. Um, so at this point, we've got our list of products that came back from the search. And I had mentioned that when you click on one of the table rows, it kicks off this selection changed event. Um, and by the way, you can just right click on these and add events, you know, whatever that particular object supports. Um, so in this case, I'm using the selection change. You can only have one, obviously, for one event type. But basically, when the person clicks the row, we show the inventory details screen. And I, you know, again, I, I want to impress upon you just like how simple this technique is, because it just it just shows the table. You would think it would need to do all kinds of stuff, but it doesn't. So here's the inventory details screen. And here's what it looks like. Um, over here, I'm going to click on one of these. And here's what happens when that screen loads. So there's um, obviously more controls on the screen because we have things like labels for each of the fields, um, a bunch of different fields, and so on. There's a button that's down here. And um, I'll explain that in a moment, but for the most part, they're just labels and fields, very similar to what we have in the FileMaker world over here, where I can have like a you know a text box or you know a text field and so on. Very similar concepts. And here's where the magic happens when the um, screen is activated. When we, in other words, when we show the inventory detail screen. What happens is that the screen opens up and then it sort of reaches back to the list screen and it says, hey, what row did the person actually click? And then what it does is it gets the, um, or, it's, or really it's what row were they on when they clicked. And then it gets this, what they call a row tag, which is that sort of hidden data that I mentioned back here. Like when the data comes in, and we start adding all the rows to the table, one of the things I do is actually take the record itself and sort of shove it into the sort of, think of it as a hidden field associated with the row. So it's actually got the entire record sitting right there, ready to go for if the person clicks the row. That is how I'm able to just very quickly move from the list view to the details view without having to make another API call. Now, it's a pretty interesting technique. I've had a lot of success with it. Your mileage may vary. If you have a huge amount of file of data coming back from FileMaker with very large records, then you might actually not want to do it this way 
because you're basically holding on to all that data in the Android app until you clear out the table, right? Like it's when I say you're holding on to it, it's during that particular use of the app, that session. Um, but if you're not dealing with huge amounts of data, then this is a pretty cool technique. It'll save you from having to make another API call back to FileMaker to say, okay, the user clicked on this record. I need to, I need you to give me more information about what they clicked on. Another reason might be that if you happen to have data where the data being displayed is changing rapidly, um, yeah, you're caching the data. So if it's changing rapidly, you'd probably want to go to the extra effort to make the query when the user taps. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So it really depends on your use case. In this particular case, you know, the, the goal with the app is really to just give people access to the data as, you know, in as simple a way as possible. It would also be, you know, easy, I think, to add a button to the screen to say, or to show, like, here's when we loaded the data, we got it from FileMaker, and then click here to refresh that data, which is an interesting concept, but it, it could be done. So... Again, the idea is when uh, the list view is displayed, you know, I'm only using some of the fields from this layout. Uh, but when they click to go to the details, I have all of that data available to me. And so it's ready to go. I do not have to make another API call. So that, it's clever, but you know, it has you need to you need to think about what your use case is and whether that's really going to work. If that's not going to work for you, then what I think you would do with the activated um, event handler is say, okay, well, what row were they on and what was the record ID, the FileMaker record ID of that record, and then make an API call back to the data API to say, okay, hey, I need more information now about that, that record. You can even reference a different layout uh, that has all the details on it. As a matter of fact, I think as a, a best practice, I would recommend that you have specific FileMaker layouts for each of those operations. Like, you know, use the, the list view to do the search and then use um, the detail view when you make the data API call to get the details. So hopefully this is all making sense. And if not, you're welcome to like ask me later or email me and I'll do my best to kind of explain all this stuff. But uh, it's kind of interesting, I think. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about is if you've ever used the FileMaker Data API or um, in the past done some PHP development with FileMaker, you know that containers, which is you know what we store um, binary data like photos and things, PDFs and so on, uh, what we use in, in FileMaker to store that kind of data can be tricky uh, when you're making API calls because FileMaker, you know, with the data API, for example, it instead of actually returning that binary data, it returns the UR, a URL, I should say, that you can use to start trying to get to the image. Um, basically, what you do is you use the URL that comes back, you make a request to it, and then that request, it sends you back a little special session ID and a URL to use to say, okay, now use these two things to actually make another request to get the data. Now, there's a, a reason that I'm not doing that here in this example, and Jeff, you and I, that's what we were talking about earlier. There's a, a limitation of one of the controls, the URL connection control, where I can't get that middle piece to work because uh, the URL connection wants to automatically redirect to that last URL and it doesn't pass the token. So that's something I think is in the works. But um, my way of working around that was to just completely bypass the need to do all that stuff. And so in FileMaker, what I've done, I mentioned I've only made really one change to this uh, database, is I have a field that I added. It's a calculated field called image B64. And the formula for it is it just does a base64 encoding of the image container. And so I have that field. I moved it over off to the right so you don't see it. Um, but if you've ever base64 encoded some data, you know it's ugly. 
So the reason I did that, and again, I would not normally recommend this, but it was my way of getting images to come through, is that that calculated field, the base64 encoded value of the image, actually comes down in the response when I make that that first you know that request for the find, which by the way is another reason why you might not want to cache that data because you know that could be a lot of data for these images. Um, so if the image, if the record actually has an image, then what I'm doing down here, and again, this is in the activated portion of the inventory detail screen, I either show or hide this button, view product photo. And that's why if you look at some of the products over here, uh, you'll see this one doesn't have an image. Um, let me see if I can go back and find another one. This was the one I showed the first time. And so this one, you'll see it does have the button. And there's the image. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm kind of conditionally showing or hiding the button on that screen. Uh, again, that's this. And if it's shown and the person clicks it, I just go to one last screen, which is this one. It's extremely simple. It's just a screen that has um, an HTML viewer control on it. Very similar to what we have in the FileMaker world. I think it's just called a web view or something. Um, it's just, you know, think of it as like a mini browser, but not quite. And when this screen activates, it just reaches back again and says, hey, uh, what row were they on? Give me the data uh, for the row that they clicked on. And then I unpack it a little bit. I get that base64 encoded value. And then I just use that to actually display it. In this case, I'm displaying it in an HTML viewer. You could use a native uh, control to show the photo. Um, I just chose to use the HTML viewer because it's really easy and I like that approach. Uh, so that's that. So uh, you know, you'll notice that we've got buttons to move back and forth here to the different screens. And there you go. So that was coming up on an hour, but that was a very quick tour of how to do an app like this. Again, it's very simple. There's a lot that I didn't show. And let me jump over, go back to my keynote. We're almost done here. Hopefully the big takeaways for you guys is that Zojo is one tool that you can do a lot of stuff with. Uh, a lot of opportunities, both for FileMaker developers, and I also, I don't know who's on the call, but if you're a Zojo developer and you want to tap into the FileMaker world for opportunities, I think you're going to find those there. Uh, there's a lot, again, that I didn't cover. I didn't talk about portals, updating data, what happens if the token expires, <laughs> logging out using the barcode scanning, camera capabilities, all that stuff. If there's interest, um, Jeff, maybe we could do a poor, uh, another uh, webinar in the future. And then some things to consider. That's not, not really a part of this. I don't know why I have that slide there. <laughs> uh, my suggestion would be to download Zojo and give it a try. Uh, the project, the Zojo project that I showed you today, I'll make that available and I'll pull the FileMaker database down off the server so that if you want to load it on your server, you can. This should be available next week. So look, I think look for a, uh, an email from Zojo. Jeff, I guess I'll you know get all that stuff to Alyssa and we'll get that. Yeah, that sounds good. So I know we're, I think, right at the very um, end of our hour, but are there any questions? Um, if you have questions, you can type them in the uh, Q&A panel. And uh, I don't think, Tim, you'll be able to see them, but I could read them if anybody has any. Um, let's give them a minute, just in case. I noticed that a lot of the code was uh, was pretty generic. So, you know, someone uh, who wanted to build their own application could use what you've created sort of as a template to learn from. And, and 
you know, you've covered most of the things they would need to do for at least for a read only application. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Just Especially, really nice. you know, some of that, the first code that I showed, you know, the logging in and stuff like that, how you make the calls back to the data API. And you know, once you've done it a few times, it starts to become familiar. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I had that slide up where all the, th all the things I didn't cover, I think we'd be here until probably another hour or more <laughs> trying Right. to go over all that stuff. So it's not really meant to be a uh, crash and complete course in Android Zojo development. But you've done a lot to get people started. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. My advice would be if you're looking, if you're going to try this and you don't want to actually use the inventory module, I would use, there's the contacts uh, starter database that FileMaker provides. And I think that one would be a good one to start with. You, again, the login process would be the same. It's the data that's coming back Uh, from the find, uh, you know, results that's going to be different. You know, in a contact database, you're going to have first and last name, email, all that good stuff. Um, so it's just a matter of changing out the field names that you want to show and things like that. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's a good foundation to get you started. And then hopefully, you know, you start to get more familiar with Sojo and then you know, on hopefully on your own or by looking at some of the other example uh, projects that ship with Zojo, you know, you could start to do things like, well, I think I want to take a stab at building a screen where they can edit the data. Um, like, for example, in that inventory example, uh, I was thinking that if I had enough time, I would add a capability to say, you know, I'm somebody who's walking around in a warehouse with an Android device. Uh, it would be great to let them scan a barcode to bring the item right up and then click to say, here's how many I'm seeing in stock, you know, at this location in the warehouse. And then behind the scenes, add um, a inventory. Um, there's a, a, a portal on that database for each item to say, we're increasing the quantity, we're decreasing the quantity and so on. So you, you, in other words, you could use it to kind of do... Uh, stock checks and things like that. So. Yeah, and it made me realize that uh, at some point I'll need to look into uh, the feasibility of supporting FileMaker in DBKit, which is a Mm -hmm. uh, thing I wrote to to take a lot of the code out of having to get the data in and out of the user interface. But I don't support mobile yet with DBKit, so mobile is the next thing, and then I should take a look at how I could support FileMaker. Yeah, and that's another, I'm glad you brought that up. So one other thing that's you know worth mentioning is I said early when I was talking about Zojo that there's a, a lot of potential code reuse between the different project types. So if you did want to try to take the Android project that we created today and build an iOS app, I think you're going to find that a lot of the code might require some minor tweaking, but a lot of the code should work. Um, the, the approach should be the same with different screens and so on. And then the same goes for if you want to try to build a desktop application or a web app. Um, yeah, you know, and then Jeff, like to your point, at that point, maybe you've got DBKit uh, that can sort of consume some of that FileMaker data. And Right. yeah, so, Okay, well, I think we have that's questions. it. Yeah. You want to go back to your final slide, Tim? Oh, sure. One second. Oops, let me share the screen before I went full screen. <laughs> yeah, so I think that was it. Um, yeah, there's the URL for Zojo, and thanks everybody for attending. I hope it was helpful, and I hope it gets you thinking, and I hope to see you on the forum, says, you know, somebody who's trying out Zojo, so... Yeah, definitely check out the forums. And uh, if you want to watch this presentation again, it'll be up on YouTube uh, later today. Um, of course, you can share it with other people as well. And thanks for joining us. And uh, we, do a, we do a webinar once a month. So be on the lookout for future webinars. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now.